mode. Good afternoon, everyone. It's Susan Goffin at Attitude Magazine. Um, today we're very pleased to have Dr. Ross Green with us. He is the author of a book that has saved many a parent um, from their own meltdown called The Explosive Child, also the author of Lost at School. And he's, he's the originator of a model of care that really focuses on collaborating with your child to resolve um, your child's behavioral challenges. He is a clinical professor at the Department of Psychiatry at the Harvard Medical School and is the founder of a nonprofit called Lives in the Balance. And I re refer you to his website, uh, livesinthebalance.org, for interesting information. Um, Dr. Green will speak for a few minutes. He has some slides that give an overview of his um, model of child behavior, and then we'll take questions for the balance of the time. So do post your questions in the box on your screen, and we will do our best to answer. He will do his best, his best to answer as many as he can. Thanks so much. And Dr. Green, let me turn it over to you, and thank you for doing this. I'm really very thanks, grateful to uh, you for your time. Thank you for doing this, and thanks to Attitude for sponsoring it. I'm glad to be doing this, and always happy to get this information out to people in any ways that we possibly can. Um, so let me just briefly, um, many of your listeners are probably familiar with my work, but just in case. Um, my model uh, brings to the table um, some important components. Component number one, children's behavioral challenges are the result of lagging skills. Not lagging motivation, lagging skills. And those lenses have important implications for not only how we are viewing these kids, very big difference between viewing a child who is doing any of the things that oppositional kids do uh, through lenses of lagging skills rather than any variety of the other lenses that we might view them through it has important implications for how we're thinking about them and responding to them. Uh, it also has important implications for how we go about trying to help them. Why are so many kids with ADHD simultaneously diagnosed with opposition defiant disorder, or ODD? Well, uh, the core features of ADHD often compromise kids' skills in the realms in which kids with ODD are having difficulty as well. Flexibility, adaptability, uh, frustration tolerance problem solving, those are the skills kids with oppositional defiant disorder are lacking, and those are also skills many kids with ADHD are also lacking. So if some of our listeners have been wondering, well, how come those two so often go together, um, there's one man's answer to that question. Uh, ADHD brings to the table skills that can cause kids and make it more difficult for kids to be flexible and adaptable. Uh, tolerate frustration and deal with it, and solve problems. Very important lenses. Here's piece number two. The lenses are the first part. The um, What we do now that we have those lenses on is the next part. Um, so often what we adults do when we are dealing with a kid who isn't doing what he's told, uh, having a lot of temper outbursts, uh, defying our rules and requests, as is sometimes called. Um, we, we often try to teach them who's boss. We often use power and control strategies. And if we think that the reason the child is acting in these ways is due to poor motivation, well then, logically, what we would do next is try to use motivational strategies to uh, change their behavior. Um, and because parents are often viewed as culpable for their child's behavior, uh, the reward and punishment strategies that we often apply are also intended to change parents' behavior. Um, and my bet is that almost all of the people who are listening to this webinar are familiar with um, the reward and punishment approach. It's where we are rewarding good behavior behaviors that we want to see more of, punishing behaviors that we want to see less of. Uh, that's done informally in many instances, but when it becomes formal, it takes the form of a you know, sticker chart, 
point program, uh, with the punishment being some form of timeout or loss of privilege, and there, a reward being um, uh, being able to cash in your stickers or your points for some goodie, or being able to get privileges. Um, and so the question often comes up, especially in the people who I work with, uh, how come these strategies aren't working very well? The answer, succinctly, is because those strategies are oriented toward improving motivation. And poor motivation is not why kids exhibit challenging behavior. So if you're applying motivational strategies to something that isn't motivational in nature, there's really no reason to expect that it would work. So of course that raises a very important question. Um, what, what should we be doing instead if, if this is about lagging skills, not lagging motivation, what should we be doing instead? Well, uh, the first thing we should be doing is figuring out what skills the child is lacking. And here I want to refer people to the website of my nonprofit that you already mentioned, www.lives with a B, lives in the balance, dot org. Or if people just Google me, lives in the balance will be the first thing that pops up. And I'd like to have people go uh, when they after this webinar to the table of contents on the left side of the home page and go to the resources section and a section called the paperwork and find an instrument called the assessment of lagging skills and unsolved problems. That instrument has listed on it uh, 20 or so skills that I frequently see lacking in behaviorally challenging kids. And job number one is to figure out what skills one's child is lacking. Um, if my daughter has a fever, I want to know why. If my son is complaining of leg pain, I want to know why. I want to know what's causing it. And if you have a behaviorally challenging child, you want to know what skills your child is lacking so that you can know what's getting in your child's way. Now, the second thing you want to do with that instrument is identify the specific conditions in which the skills your child is lacking are causing difficulty for your child. And in the abstract, those lagging skills would be causing difficulty especially in the conditions in which the lagging skills are being demanded by the environment. That's it in the abstract. But we're going to want to be more specific about that. We want to identify these specific problems. I call them unsolved problems that are being caused by those lagging skills and demands for those skills. And that, to be more specific, uh, some fairly standard unsolved problems that seem to come into play with a lot of kids. Um, who exhibit challenging behavior in response to these unsolved problems. And by the way, the reason I call them unsolved problems is because if they were solved, they wouldn't be setting in motion challenging behavior. The fact that they are setting in motion challenging behavior tells us that they are unsolved. And what I find is that many uh, challenging kids have a rather impressive pile of unsolved problems that have accumulated over time problems that are setting in motion challenging episodes very reliably every hour, every day, every week. We want to identify unsolved problems as well. Here's some examples. Difficulty brushing teeth at night. Difficulty completing the paragraph in the English homework. Uh, difficulty completing the double digit division problems in math. Um, difficulty getting ready for school in the morning. Uh, difficulty getting along with Charlie on the school bus on the way to school. Uh, difficulty coming in from playing outside when called for dinner. Uh, difficulty um, ending the video game to go to bed at 9 p.m. Notice they all end, they all start with the word difficulty, and then what comes after the word difficulty is whatever expectation it is that the child is having difficulty. Eating. That's the unsolved problem. And um, so there are some examples provided on the assessment of lagging skills and unsolved problems. So we've now accomplished by, by people taking the time to identify their child's lagging skills and unsolved problems. We've accomplished something very important. First, now we know what will work. First of all, we now have the right lenses on. Uh, we know what skills the child is lacking. But we also know what problems we need to solve with the child 
so as to reduce the likelihood of challenging behavior in response to those problems. And now we only really have one other thing to cover. How do we want to go about solving those problems? Uh, you've got a few options. First of all, and I, I call those options Plan A, Plan B, and Plan C. Plan C is an important plan. That's the plan that we're using for some of the unsolved problems, the ones we don't want to be working on right now. Because the pile of unsolved problems is so big and because um, we're not going to be able to work on them all at once, we're going to have to table some of them for now. Those are the ones we're using Plan C on. That's not giving in. That's just saying we need to prioritize here because one of the biggest reasons the unsolved problems of behaviorally challenging kids remain unsolved is because we adults are still going about trying to solve them all at once. That's Plan C now. We're not going to solve a bunch of them in the beginning. We're going to prioritize. All right, now just two other options. With Plan A, you're solving the problem unilaterally typically through imposition of adult will. And that's something that we adults tend to be famous for. The problem, of course, is that when we are solving problems through imposition of adult will unilaterally, well, unilateral problem solving often sets in motion challenging episodes in challenging kids. Now, why might that be? Because none of us actually loves having will imposed upon us. Those of us who uh, have the skills to deal with having will imposed upon us uh, don't get too upset about it when it happens. But behaviorally challenging kids, the skills they're lacking are also making it difficult for them to respond to having will imposed upon them. And that's why it's so reliable that if you rewind the tape on the vast majority of challenging episodes and challenging kids, which you'll find is an adult using plan A, an adult trying to solve a problem unilaterally through imposition of adult will. And that, by the way, is also where adult-imposed consequences often come in. Uh, here's what I've been saying lately, it's been, this is sort of fascinating. When we adults discover that the solution that we have come up with for the problem isn't solving the problem, we often kick in with adult-imposed consequences so as to give the kid the incentive to do the solution that already clearly isn't working. Um, what we need is a different plan. And what I spend most of my working hours teaching people to do is plan B. And I also spend most of my waking hours teaching people that they don't need plan A anywhere nearly as much as they think they do. Plan B is where you're solving the problem collaboratively instead. Any problem that can be solved with plan A can also be solved with plan B. And here's the best part. Because we've already used the assessment of lagging skills and unsolved problems to identify the child's unsolved problems, those unsolved problems are now highly predictable. And we can solve them proactively. So what I spend most of my waking hours teaching people how to do is solve problems collaboratively and proactively. Those are the two components of the model. Now, I should spend one more minute, and then we can go straight to questions, talking about Plan B, because there are three steps for doing Plan B, probably familiar to many of the people who are listening in here. Uh, step number one is called the empathy step, but the main ingredient is information gathering and understanding. Gathering information about and understanding what? The child's concern or perspective on the unsolved problem we're talking with him about, him or her about, proactively right now. Kids have info we badly need, info that we need to understand what's getting in the kid's way, info that we need to understand the kid's concern or perspective on this unsolved problem. If we don't get that info from the kid, then we adults are at risk for doing what we so often do, imposing solutions that are uninformed. The empathy step is crucial. 
If you find the problem step is next, this is where the adult is getting their concern or perspective entered into consideration. Adults have important concerns as well. The exact same concerns that could lead adult into plan A could also lead an adult into plan B. Same concern, different approach to getting addressed. Same problem, different approach to getting it solved. And then finally, uh, the third step is the invitation. This is where child and adult are brainstorming solutions, collaborating on solutions. But solutions that meet two criteria. Criteria number one, the solution has to be realistic, meaning both parties can actually do what they're agreeing to do. And criteria number two, the solution has to be mutually satisfactory, meaning that it truly and logically addresses the concerns of both parties, concerns that people put a lot of hard work into getting entered into consideration in those first two steps of plan B. There's the rough summary of the model. Let's take some questions. OK. Um, maybe one way to go about this would be to um, tell you um, a very uh, a, a Let's see, a, a question that was posted probably 10 times in different forms, and I think it's sort of a quintessential um, <laughs> question. And here's an example. Um, I have a six-year-old boy with ADHD who's great when he gets to do what he wants to do when he wants to do it. However, when I ask him to do something like a chore or picking up something, he says no and then escalates into calling me stupid, idiotic, and when reprimanded, he says, I don't care. He won't go into time out. He's too big to carry out. Losing privileges makes no difference. Um, I can't allow him to be disrespectful to me, but how do I handle this? Uh, he often, this is something that many people mention, often apologizes later for his own behavior when he calms down. But it's not a solution to uh, coping with it at the time that it happens. So we, there are probably 10 people who've written literally those exact words, different age children, different, different descriptions, but essentially child is fine until asked to do something that he or she just doesn't want to do and then goes into a rage. Um, well, and that's, that you're right. That is the quintessential question. <laughs> right. um, for, let's establish something very important right up front, though. We all want to do what we want to do, and we don't want to do what we don't want to do. So that's not just true of behaviorally challenging kids, it's true of everybody. So now comes the big question. If we're blocking at doing something that we don't want to do, we're not just going along with the plan, there's, a, there's two different paths the adult can go down. Uh, and the first is the path that you're describing in this question. And that is for the adult to insist that the child do what mm -hmm. they want him to do. Um, and then when the child walks even further to um, threaten uh, or to administer punishment, which often now elicits the child's worst behavior, with disrespect being certainly on that spectrum, but uh, sometimes, quite frankly, at the mild end of that spectrum compared to what some kids do under these identical circumstances. Right. Um, and then uh, we adults then do what we often were trained to do. We try to get the kid to go into time out or we you know, take away a privilege, sometimes escalating things even further still. And then when the smoke clears, the child um, is sorry they did what he did. And quite frankly, that's true too. The child is not happy that, and I'm going to put this into my own words, the child is not happy that people haven't yet figured out what skills he's lacking and haven't yet inquired with him, and this would be a much more collaborative and proactive approach, what's getting in his way on the different chores that he seems to be struggling to do, um, and uh, what are the adult's concerns about why they feel it's important to do those concerns? That would be to define the problem step. And now, how can we work together to come up with a solution so that we're not fighting about chores anymore. And that's a completely different path to go down. It's completely different than in the heat of the moment, insisting, reprimanding, punishing, and having everybody pay the price for that. Now, here's the interesting thing. No, it's true. You can't let your child be disrespectful. But we have to remember that disrespect is usually, not always, but almost always, 
the aftermath of the scenario that I just described. And I find that when we are solving problems collaboratively and proactively, we don't see disrespect anymore because the problems have been solved in a way that's realistic and that works for both parties. Could you um, describe a, a bit about, in that scenario, how a parent would uh, work collaboratively with their child to address, let's take the examples that are frequently given here, unpleasant chores, whether those be brushing teeth or putting away clothes. Um, well, the, kind timing of chores that, that, excuse the, me? the timing here is crucial. Okay. Um, you don't want to be dealing with this in the heat of the moment, and that's where people end up dealing with it 95% of the time. Um, we, we wait until this highly predictable, unsolved problem pops up again before we try to deal with it. And dealing with it in the heat of the moment adds two undesirable ingredients. Heat, as in heat of the moment, uh, at which point most people, challenging kids included, and their, and their caregivers included, aren't thinking very clearly, and rush. Uh, you know, these things often pop up when we want to get some other stuff done, when we're on our way to someplace else. So the timing of doing this emergently is all off. Um, quite frankly, I would recommend that people, if chores is an unsolved problem, the first thing people have to decide is whether they want to deal with it with plan C or plan B. In other words, is this one of their top priorities at the moment? If not, they're not going to be talking to the kid about chores for the time being until they fry some of their bigger fish and try to solve some of their higher priority unsolved problems. So that's task number one. Let's identify these unsolved problems ahead of time so we can proactively decide how we want to handle them, C or B. If this is B, then we want to find a time to have a proactive discussion with the child so that this problem can be solved collaboratively and proactively. Um, can you explain, give a sample conversation? I think people would really, sure. would really yeah, find that absolutely. useful. Absolutely. Uh, the empathy step usually begins with the words, I've noticed that. Billy, I've noticed that you're having difficulty um, taking the garbage out before the trash people come on Tuesday mornings. And then this introduction to the empathy step always ends with the words, what's up? What's up? What's up, um, yep. Now, there's a few different things that can happen when a child says, when we say, what's up? In fact, I've identified the six most likely things that happen after we say, what's up? Possibly number one, he says something. Possibly number two, he says nothing. Possibly number three, he says, I don't know. Possibly <laughs> number four, he says, I don't have a problem with that. Possibly number five, he says, I don't want to talk about it right now. Possibility number six, he gets defensive and says something uh, like, uh, I don't have to talk to you. Now, the, the one that we hope happens is that he actually says something. And um, unless we have time on this webinar, I'll refer people to the Lives in the Balance website for how they should respond to the other five. But if the child says something, the first thing the child says isn't going to give us a clear enough sense of what's really getting in the way, which means we're going to probably have to, in all likelihood, we'll have to probe for more information. And that's a process I call drilling, drilling for information. And drilling is without question the hardest part of doing all of Plan B. Um, people get stuck there, the, but, but there's lots of great information about drilling, including some, some strategies that people can use to drill uh, on the Live in the Balance website, especially in the radio program's listening library. So there's lots of shows that are specifically describing and helping people drill well. Um, but let's say the child says uh, it's too dark. That's his first response. The adult tendency is to then think they know what the kid means and to move on, but we're not going to do that. We're going to use a drilling strategy, and the most common drilling strategy, but by no means the only one, is just reflective listening, saying back to the kid whatever the child just said to you. It's too dark. And then often adding a clarifying statement like, um, how so? It's too dark outside when I'm supposed to take the trash out 
on Tuesday mornings. It's too dark outside when you're trying to take the trash out on Tuesday mornings. Help me understand how that's a problem for you. I'm scared. You're scared. Um, say more. I'm scared to be outside in the dark without one of you there. Oh, so taking the trash out on Tuesday morning when it's still dark, the dark is scary for you. Is that what you're trying to say? Yes. And that's the why you don't do it? Right. And then you get all mad that I don't do it and you yell at me, but it's all that yelling, and a kid probably isn't going to say that I'm just doing this to drive the point home. All that yelling isn't helping me with the fact that it's dark out and I'm scared. Now the adult might be thinking many things at this point. The adult might be thinking, geez, I thought it was just because he was lazy, or geez, I thought it was just because he hates taking the trash out. Um, that's we, we adults are frequently wrong in our assumptions about what's getting in the kid's way, and that's why the empathy step is so important. Now the empathy step can go on well beyond that, but I'm gonna I'm gonna end the empathy step right there. Um, I wouldn't. I would ask for more, and when the kid has no more to give, that's when the empathy step is truly done. But let's, for the, in the interest of time, let's move on to the define the problem step. This is where the adult is getting their concern onto the table, usually beginning with the word, my concern is, or the thing is. That's what that would sound like. My concern is that if you don't put the trash out, then um, there's no trash there for the trash people to take, and then the trash piles up, and we get rats, and mice and other rodents, and um, that's not very sanitary for any of us. The adult's concern is now on the table. The very same concern that might have led the adult to, say, give the kid a sticker every time he takes the trash out when he's supposed to, is now going to be addressed through an entirely different process. The concern is still going to get addressed. That's the important thing for people to understand a lot of people look at this model and they're so worried about giving in that somehow, some way, they view this model as a form of giving in. And this model is not a form of giving in. There's actually no giving in in this model. Let's move on. The adult concern is now on the table. Let's put the, let, now let's brainstorm solutions. So I wonder if there's a way, that's how the invitation usually begins, I wonder if there's a way for us to do something about you being scared of the dark when you're supposed to take out the trash. That's the kid's concern getting back on the table. But still make sure that there's trash there for the trash man to take so the trash doesn't pile up and we don't get rodents and it's not all unsanitary. That's the adult's concern. Once again, being entered into consideration. And then we're going to give the child the first crack at the solution. You got any ideas? Now, maybe he does and maybe he doesn't. It's not his responsibility to come up with a solution. It's just good strategy. Let them know beyond a shadow of a doubt that we're actually interested in his ideas, but this is a team effort. So if the child doesn't have any solutions, we hope the adult does. And what kind of solution are we trying to come up with? A solution that will address the child's concern about being scared of the dark, but still make sure that there's trash there for the trash guys to get so that it doesn't pile up so that they don't get rodents. Now what would a potential solution be, possibly? And I'm, I'm not one for telling people what the solutions are. I just know what the criteria are. It has to be realistic. It has to be mutually satisfactory. One potential solution, uh, this came up recently in my work, is that the child would uh, take the trash out in the afternoon the day before. And that's when the adult would be reminding him to do it. And last I heard, that solution was still working. Solutions don't work. Solutions we adults come up with don't work if they are uninformed solutions. If we don't know what's getting in the kid's way, it is impossible to come up with a solution that will address it. Um, so there are a large number of people here who say that their child won't articulate why they won't do it, won't talk, will just melt down, become quiet, uh, if not very aggressive, one or the other. Um, where do they start? It sounds like it sounds like the key to the technique, which makes enormous sense, is 
to prompt the child to articulate the cause for the, the behavior. But there are many cases, at least among those who have written in, where the behavior um, is pretty broad, again, to, involves all kinds of different activities and is a very difficult time getting the child to speak. Um, and, and I guess, it, I don't know if this is the same question or not, but people are also writing in to say, well, it sounds like much of this work has to go on before the heat of the moment, which makes enormous sense. So what then should they do in the heat of the moment? And, you know, these are two separate issues, I guess. Those are, those are two different questions. Right. Let me, um, the easy one to answer, or actually either of them, is, um, let, let's answer the, one of them first. Um, what should you do in the heat of the moment? Defuse, de-escalate, keep everybody safe, and then figure out what set that unsolved problem in motion in the first place so that you can solve it proactively and not in the heat of the moment. That's what you're doing in the heat of the moment. Nobody has incredible advice for what to do in the heat of the moment because there's nothing <laughs> right. to do in the heat yeah. of the moment. So right. um, that's usually a fairly quick one to answer. People dealing with unsolved problems in the heat of the moment are frequently those who haven't yet filled out the assessment of lagging skills and unsolved problems yet. And so mm -hmm. they don't have their list of unsolved problems yet. And therefore, the problems that are setting in motion challenging behavior are still feeling surprising and unpredictable to them. That's why I always say it all begins, the journey begins with the assessment of lagging skills and unsolved problems. It is crucial to identify lagging skills and unsolved problems ahead of time. Otherwise, we're stuck in the heat of the moment. One of the beauty, any unsolved problem we've written in on the assessment of lagging skills and unsolved problems is by definition predictable. Otherwise, we wouldn't have been able to write it in. So now we kind of have to reorganize our lives a little bit. Because, and quite frankly, the explosions or the challenging behavior take way more time than proactive plan B is going to. But proactive plan B is going to work a whole lot better than emergency plan B. So, you know, quite frankly, this is one of the ways in which I and other clinicians who are using this model help families sort of reorganize things a little bit so that they are approaching problems in a much more proactive way. That's the answer to heat of the moment. What do we do about kids who won't talk? Well, uh, in your wording of that question, you are referring to behavior. We are talking to the child about his behavior. The behavior is not the unsolved problem. This is a huge point. We're not talking to the child about hitting. We're not talking to the child about screaming or swearing. These are the things the child does in response to unsolved problems, but aren't the unsolved problem. The unsolved problem is difficulty taking the trash out on Tuesday mornings so the trash man can get the trash. That's the or, unsolved problem. Or getting what up in the child, morning for school, getting dressed on time, et cetera. Et cetera. Those are the unsolved right. problems. Right. What the child does when the adult is insisting that the child do what the adult is insisting to do, the child do, that's behavior. But that's not the unsolved problem. So here's, this is where it's sort of all, this is sort of the divide in the road in terms of what are we focused on with the child? Is behavior or the problems setting in motion the behavior? Now, if you ask a kid about his behavior, uh, even if you're doing it proactively, number one, a lot of kids won't talk to you because they feel like they're in trouble again. Number two, they're defensive. Um, that you know, Now they're being called on the carpet for their behavior yet again. And number three, we're really not asking them about anything. Because if this child is a hitter, then he hits when he's being asked to take the trash out, and he hits when he's being asked to do his homework, and he hits when he's being asked to go to bed at night, and he hits when, he gets, when he's being told to get off the video game. Hitting a behavior cuts across many unsolved problems, and each of those unsolved problems need to be solved. But here's the interesting thing. Once again, this is the divide in the road. What we do is we'll put the stick on a kid, what we often do, and this is not what I recommend, we put the kid on a sticker chart for each time he doesn't hit. He loses a sticker if he hits, he gets a sticker if he doesn't, he gets enough sticker, he's a, he gets a goodie. All of that is entirely focused on behavior. And yet, 
even if he stops hitting. Unlikely, by the way. Many people have had that experience. The problems that were giving rise to the hitting are still unsolved, and we still know nothing about them. Because all we've really done is put the child on a sticker chart for hitting. Here's the good news. If you solve the trash problem, if that problem gets solved collaboratively and proactively, not only is the problem going to get solved, the hitting that goes along with the problem is going to subside. Because now the problem that was giving rise to the hitting has been solved. Completely different mentality completely different focus. So many of us were trained to focus on behavior. In this model, you're focused on the problems that are giving rise to that behavior. A radical shift in what we're focused on and what we're trying to accomplish. Very interesting. Um, there are a number of, of, of parents who are very concerned about violence. So here's one. My seven-year-old son is very violent toward me during all of his rages. Um, and so forth. So in those cases, um, can you give some examples of how the parent would get at the underlying causes um, of, of, and there are similar, uh, similar questions relating to violence and aggression towards siblings or toward another parent. Um, well, first of all, um, what violence usually refers to is a more severe form of looking bad. So this is a child who isn't just screaming, swearing, not that those are so pleasant. Right. This is a child who is destroying property, physically aggressing toward people. Um, there's there's uh, ver verbal violence as well. Um, and none of that is... Um, all of that is extremely difficult to live with. But what that mostly speaks to, as hard as it can be to live with, is, is the severity of the child's response to the unsolved problem and to the environment's response to the child having difficulty with the unsolved problem. So this is not meant to diminish how awful it is to live with a child who is being violent toward a, a parent or a sibling or a teacher. But it is basically saying that what we're talking about here is the severity of the child's response. And severity doesn't necessarily alter the approach. Once again, we don't want to be primarily dealing with a severe response to an unsolved problem. We're calling it violence, but I'll call it severe in the heat of the moment because it's already happening. And now we're very wrapped up in what are we going to do now that this child is completely out of control and hurting people. Horrible timing. It's that timing is what gets a lot of kids, what gets adults to lay hands on a lot of kids in the form of a restraint or a seclusion um, or physically holding a child in time out. And to tell you the truth, we don't want to be doing that. Th those are last resorts. Unfortunately, those are often acts of desperation. But if we are solving, if we're identifying the problems that are giving rise to the severe response ahead of time, and we are okay. prioritizing, and there's a bunch that we're not working on right now. The child is not going to respond violently to problems we are not working on right now. And if we use plan B to come up with proactive and collaborative solutions to those problems that we are working on, we are going to see a rapid, dramatic reduction in violent behavior. Now, while there are some kids, and I should probably mention this at this point, are there some kids who get out of control so quickly and are um, so revved up so much of the time or so irritable so much of the time that before they can participate in this process, they need medical intervention to, to muffle their emotions or reduce their activity level or enhance their mood. Yes, mm -hmm. that happens. Um, and there, there are medications that can sometimes be helpful along those lines. Um, but I must say, in the vast majority of instances, I'm finding that plan C 
the things we're not bringing up right now and solving problems with Plan B can be an extremely effective way to reduce violence if we're going through the steps that I've been describing during this program. Some questions that are uh, fine-tuning within this framework. Um, here's someone, Wendy, who says one of the most frustrating things for us is that even after having had a successful collaboration with my child about an unresolved problem, let's take example the trash problem, only a few weeks later my child finds a new reason not to take out the trash. Does this mean that there's yet another unresolved problem that he didn't share the first time, or is this is something else going on? So there's this. Well, um, my first my first take at that is that number one, it's not uncommon for the first solution to not solve the problem durably, and that's what she's describing. The first solution didn't solve the problem durably. Right. Now, why do I not feel bad about that? Because in real life, the first solution seldom solves the problem durably. Uh, not, even, not just in the context of this model. In real life, the, fir the first solution seldom solves the problem durably. In real life, good solutions, durable ones, come from what we've learned from the solutions that preceded them that didn't quite work so well. So now the question becomes, how come the solution didn't stand the test of time? And I can think of three reasons, one of which Wendy, who asked the question, has already actually uh, mentioned. But I'm going to mention that one third. Here's possibly number one. The solution wasn't as realistic as we thought it was. We thought it was. It wasn't. That should come out in the plan B wash, as I say. Um, possibly number two. The solution wasn't as mutually satisfactory as we thought it was. We thought it was. We thought it addressed the concerns of both parties. But there are concerns that, so, that the solution didn't address as well as we thought it did. And now possibly number three, and this is the one that mentioned that Wendy uh, kind of hinted at. We've only done plan B on this unsolved problem once, and we got as many of the concerns of the child and many of the concerns of the adult entered into, into consideration in our one plan B discussion, but, and therefore our solution addressed only the concerns that we heard about, but the solution wouldn't address the concerns that we didn't hear about. Back to plan B to figure out what those concerns are and see if we missed something, or at the very least to inquire about why the solution that seemed to be working for a while isn't working now. Going straight back to the empathy step to find out what's going on. I think some parents are, are posting, you know, are, are, are we not being manipulated? I mean, that's, I think, the concern, you know, is this, it, are these behaviors manipulative to avoid doing the task? Um, and a couple of posts to that about man, being manipulated. Well, nobody loves being manipulated. <laughs> um, I, and everybody's worried about being manipulated. Um, the whole manipulation idea comes from the belief that the child's challenging behavior is an effective means of coercing adults into capitulating to the child's wishes. Right. That's not, that's not this model. That's a okay. different way of thinking. When you're solving problems collaboratively, you're a team. This is not adversarial. This is not enemies. This is teamwork. The child and the adult are collaborative are, are problem-solving partners, is what we might call it. And um, there's really no reason for the child to manipulate when this is not adversarial, and when this is not enemies, and when this is a problem-solving partnership. But the reality is I don't think kids are being manipulative anywhere nearly as often as they are accused of being manipulative. Right. That comes from a completely different way of thinking that I do mm -hmm. not subscribe to. Um, there's a couple of posts here of, from parents who are trying, I think, quite collaboratively to work with their child and are, and are being constantly lied to. For example, quote um, from Catherine, my child consistently lies about tasks that we've collaboratively come up with a solution for. For example, we decided that he will brush his teeth in the morning with only two reminders. He consistently lies and says he's done the task. He's 13 years old, by the way. It sounds like a this is a behavior and we try to reinforce it, but it's very challenging. He says he lies to avoid punishment, but we've had many conversations about the fact that he won't 
to be punished if he doesn't brush his teeth. He'll just have to brush his teeth. So there's an example. And there's another person who says, what about you know compulsive lying? Um, it's hard to tell what the true issue is. My son constantly changes his answer three or four times, tells me one thing and the teacher another. So um, any thoughts on, on that sorts of behavior? Well, What's underlying uh, that? Or? The one that's the most specific is the teeth brushing one. Yes. And given the lenses that I wear, um, what I'm hearing in what was described by the question is a solution that isn't mutually satisfactory yet. Right. Um, and what I'm hearing is a that there must be something that is still keeping the child from brushing his teeth and uh, t telling the child that not to lie about it because he's not going to get in trouble, he's just going to have to brush his teeth, um, is a good example of what we adults sometimes say, but that actually still wouldn't solve the teeth brushing problem. Mm -hmm. um, in other words, if in the parlance of this model, what we're saying is, don't lie about not brushing your teeth. We're just going to do plan A when you don't brush them. <laughs> we're going to make you brush them, right? Correct. So that, all that says to me, and you know, I have a, I have different, I have a different filter on here. I hear in that description a solution that isn't mutually satisfactory, and mm -hmm. what I'm really hearing is a, um, the, uh, the distinct possibility that the concerns of the child still aren't well understood yet, and or that the solution that they have come up with um, isn't getting the job done. Simply insisting that the child brush his teeth isn't going to solve that problem. Okay. Now, the other so, time I hear lying come up, I should add, mm -hmm. um, sometimes people say that a kid is lying when they are talking with a child about one specific incident, um, and there are eyewitness accounts and it gets into a he said, she said, or here's what I saw, no, that's not what happened. But we really don't want to get into he said, she said, or here's what the eyewitnesses saw, because those are usually only about one event. So let me give you an example that comes to mind. Um, I saw you hit Billy on the playground uh, when you guys were disagreeing about the boxball game. I didn't hit him. I saw you hit him. I didn't hit him. I saw you hit him. Okay, this is going nowhere, right? But right. Hitting, hitting is the behavior. And, and what we're into now is sort of a, um, what resembles much more closely a um, police interrogation, not plan B. The unsolved problem, if this is a one-timer, then it's a one-timer. But the likelihood is that this is not a one-timer. We want to be talking with the child about the disagreements he's having with Billy during box ball on the playground. And if we're talking with him about that, that, then what happened during the disagreement that occurred at 2.15 p.m. on Tuesday actually doesn't matter so much anymore. Number one, that's a one-time incident. And number two, we'd rather be talking with a child about an unsolved problem rather than his challenging behavior. But number two, if that problem gets solved, we're not going to have to talk with him about hitting anymore anyways, and now the eyewitness accounts don't matter, the problem is solved. There's not going to be any hitting in response to that unsolved problem anymore. And, well, that's, that's often when adults are telling me that a child is lying. That may not be exactly what the person who wrote the question was mm -hmm. referring to, but that's the most common scenario in which I hear people telling me that the child is lying. Um, the eyewitness accounts differ. The child is lying. Here's what I've found about lying. I, some people may not love hearing this. I always find that there's behind every so-called lie, there's a kernel of truth. Interesting. Yeah, there's something in there that's that's going on. Correct. What else we got? Um, here's a person who says, "What if the problem is just not realistic? Like the problem? I'm not sure this is a problem, but the problem is that they want to play video games and Legos all day long." And they don't want to stop. How do you get? How do you get a transition without an aggressive meltdown? Mm, I would have to reword that unsolved yeah. problem. Um, it, it's what the child is supposed to be doing instead 
of playing video games and Legos all day long. Right, the behavior yeah, is would, the video games and the problem is, is something else. I don't know what the problem is. Uh, if the mm -hmm. problem is going to school, um, that's the unsolved problem. I've noticed that you're having difficulty going to school. What's up? If the problem is um, hanging out with friends on the weekend, you know, I'm not exactly sure when this unsolved problem is happening. If the unsolved problem is hanging out with friends or going to do an, a, a, an activity, um, I've noticed that you don't seem to want to play with your friends during the weekend. What's up? I've noticed that you don't want to go out for any teams. What's up? Uh, I've noticed that when we want to go out and do something like go to the park on the weekends, you um, aren't too enthusiastic about that. What's up? So I would reword it so that I could uh, not be talking with the child about what he is doing, the behavior, but rather the expectation he's having difficulty meeting. Okay. Um, that's good. There, there's a comment from someone here that someone here that also raises another question. She's first saying how much help she got from reading The Explosive Child and that she wanted to add that her daughter has had a diff very difficult time explaining the problems she was having and she had to, have, had to figure them out. And once she did, her behavior changed. But the key in this person's case was um, having her learning disabilities diagnosed. She, once she determined that her, she had undiagnosed learning disabilities, it became much easier for them to understand the problems that she could not verbalize. And that raises the question for me of a number of people have posted asking, you know, how do they distinguish oppositional defiant disorder from a whole variety of things, bipolar disease, sensory integration disorder, um, lots of other things going on, learning disabilities. Do you have thoughts on, on parsing apart those, those different um, disabilities and behaviors? Well, I'm, th this is, uh, uh, this speaks to why I'm not a very diagnostically oriented mental health professional. <laughs> Opposition defiant disorder is a list of behaviors that we don't like, that it has been determined tend to clump together. Um, the same can be said about virtually all childhood psychiatric diagnoses. If you look at the criteria for the diagnosis, it is a list of behaviors that are what we would call developmentally deviant. In other words, not behaviors that we would expect for a child of the same age and developmental level. Um, but if that's what a diagnosis is, a list of behaviors, then it gets very confusing when we're trying to decide whether the child has this disorder or that disorder. Because what we're really saying then is, is the child exhibiting these behaviors or those behaviors? Because it's behaviors that comprise psychiatric diagnoses in children. And I'm usually, it doesn't take me long to talk with adults and get a pretty clear picture about the challenging behaviors the child is exhibiting. But rather than, and this is another important fork in the road, Rather than thinking now, how do those behaviors clump together? We've already established during this program that behavior is not the most important part. There are behaviors that kids exhibit when they are under duress and having difficulty solving a problem uh, that are more mild. And there are behaviors that kids exhibit under those circumstances that are more extreme. Uh, those are behaviors. Where I'm going is, I'm going straight for, OK, I, I, I know what the behaviors are. I'm not thinking, now, what psychiatric diagnosis best summarizes those behaviors? What I'm thinking instead is, what unsolved problems can I learn as much about as possible that are giving rise to those behaviors? That's where I'm going. And that requires not asking the question, so what did he do? What does he do? But what behaviors is he exhibiting? But rather, tell me about what was going on when those behaviors were being exhibited. What was the disagreement about? What was he balking at doing? What were you insisting that he do that he didn't want to do? Because those questions are the ones that are going to give us the information we need about what the child's unsolved problems are. If we are focused on behavior and diagnosis, then we still, and this is, boy, I cannot say, I'm glad we're covering this because this is so important. <laughs> when we focus on behavior, 
we focus on modifying it. When we focus on diagnosis, it makes it sound like the problem resides entirely within the child and that it's the child who needs to be fixed. When we focus on the problems that are giving rise to those behaviors, and when we recognize that it is those behaviors, when they clump together, that comprise psychiatric diagnoses, when we're focused on problems, we can focus on solving problems. But we have to get the information to that level of analysis to begin focusing on problems rather than behaviors and diagnoses. And okay. boy, is that crucial. So it really is about going back to the beginning and saying what circumstances brought about this behavior, not how do I fix this behavior, or what, what psychiatric disorders causing this behavior. Uh, what, what what circumstances um, cause this behavior? Um, in other words, saying that a child is hyperactive, impulsive, and inattentive because he has ADHD is basically repeating ourselves. If I could <laughs> right. just as easily say, right. he has ADHD because he's hyperactive, impulsive, and inattentive. We need to get to the level of lagging skill. And that was the beginning of the question, by the way how much the person who wrote the question learned about the child. But the earth-shattering moment was when they realized what skills their child was lacking, right. not what the behaviors were, and not what the diagnosis was. Interesting. OK. Um, just to turn for a second, we're sort of almost out of time, unfortunately, um, to school. There are a number of, of folks who, well, there are two number of folks whose children refuse to go to school, stop performing in school, seem depressed, angry, um, even um, a, a child whose love, love of his life is um, baseball, and because of his performance in school, he's no longer able to play on the baseball team, but still refuses to, to um, go to school, study for exams, and so forth. A um, number of people who, whose children are really school resistant. Um, any thoughts on how to tackle, I guess, I'm going to answer the question, you know, what's going on here? Yeah. Well, by this point in the webinar, the mm -hmm. answer is probably crystal clear. There are unsolved problems at school right. that we may not know about yet. Even if we know about them, they haven't been solved yet. Mm -hmm. Even if we've tried to solve them, they haven't been solved in a way that's actually working. And we can punish the kid till the cows come home. We can take away everything. The problem is still going to be there. And until we solve them collaboratively and proactively, the behaviors are going to remain. OK. Yep, makes sense. Um, a couple of people say that they've, they've put in place your, your, your techniques, and they've had tremendous success on the home front. But they're, it's not what's going on at school. The school environment is punitive and you know, sort of much more focused on um, punishment and that their, their children are having tremendous difficulty at school, um, even though they've seen success in turning around their behavior on the home front. And they're asking, you know, what do they do? How do they, how do they transmit some of these techniques in the school environment? They find somebody, and they're absolutely right. I mean, one of my biggest missions in life these days is to transform school discipline programs from the punitive, adversarial, unilateral to collaborating and helping kids and adults become teammates on solving problems. That's, that occupies a great deal of my thinking and my efforts these days. But I guess the key strategy is to find somebody in the building, guidance counselor, teacher, school psychologist, principal, assistant principal, somebody who is open to these ideas and willing to help the parent strategize about how to help these ideas find their way into the way adults understand and interact with their child. And um, unfortunately, that's a sound bite. There's a lot more information about that on the Lives in the Balance website in the listening library for parents as well. OK, that's great. Um, sounds like your website's a great resource. Thank you again. I think the perspective you bring is so such a fresh one. Just makes us all stop and ask ourselves about our model of enforcing behavior and repression and sort of punishment as a 
as a way to, be, to control behavior. So thank you so much for, your, for all your time and all that, that you've done. To the folks I on the webinar, I oh, thank you for participating. And um, our next webinar is April 18th. It is about teens executive um, behavior with Peg Dawson, who's just written a new book on that topic. And I invite you to, to, to dial back in. Dr. Green, thank you so much. Appreciate very My pleasure. Happy time. to do it anytime. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Take care.